Good morning. This is Andrew Mills of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you for joining our webinar. Um, today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Naeem Darguth, who will be presenting findings from research on the potential demand charge savings from solar PV on commercial customers. This research is part of a broader investigation uh, that has also looked at demand charges for residential customers, and some upcoming work will be using the same uh, framework to look at uh, solar and storage combinations, and also uh, issues around rate design and better alignment between utility customers and, util and uh, utilities and customer interests. The presentation today will be about 40 minutes or so, which will leave about 10 to 20 minutes uh, of time for questions and answers. Everybody is going to be in listen-only mode during this presentation, but if you have any questions that come up at any point, you can add those into the, the chat box and uh, put your questions on uh, early or, or, or at the end of the presentation, and we'll start to go through those after the presentation. Uh, any of the questions that we're not able to get to, we'll go ahead and, and try to follow up via email uh, afterwards. Um, uh, and at that, uh, oh, one other thing to note is that um, there are slides available for this. Uh, I'll put the, the uh, link uh, into the chat box also. Um, if you want to download a version of this briefing, uh, you can, you can uh, download those slides. Uh, they are available. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Naeem to give the presentation. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and thanks again for all um, joining us today. I hope you find this webinar useful and interesting. And um, as Andrew said, please feel free to enter the questions in the chat box. Uh, it should be on the left side of your uh, screen. So again, uh, as Andrew said, the slides I'll be going through are available on our website. And they'll be on the website in a slightly more uh, detailed form, um, as is also an executive summary of the study, which is in text form, which provides the, really the principal findings and, and conclusions um, in a more succinct form. So uh, I'd like to thank the DOE Solar Energy Technology Office in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, and I'd like to thank the members of our advisory group, as well as the reviewers of uh, earlier versions of this uh, slide deck. So let's jump right in, um, as we've got a lot to cover in the next uh, 40 minutes or so. So I'm not going to be covering all the slides from the online version of the slide deck, um, mostly because I just can't speak that fast. So I selected some of the key findings to present today. So uh, after an overview slide, I'll be discussing some background, what motivated the study, followed by a quick summary of the methodology um, before we dive into the results, finishing off with some of the key conclusions and policy implications from the work. So in this study, we've simulated demand charge savings from commercial solar using a number of demand charge designs. Uh, our analysis includes customers in 15 cities, uh, looking at nine different PV system sizes, four panel orientations, and all this over a 17-year period. Uh, we consider, consider several uh, flavors of demand charges, including the most common basic demand charge, uh, one with seasonally varying price, uh, ratchet, as well as demand charges defined over a large number of peak window periods. And I'll be covering uh, these in more detail in a slide later on. So the study focuses specifically on commercial uh, customers with solar and, and seeks to answer the basic question, which is um, to what extent and under what conditions can rooftop solar reduce commercial demand charges? The analysis summarized here is uh, the second in the series of studies, as Andrew mentioned. Uh, back in January, we released a study whose focus was residential customers and how residential solar can impact demand charge savings. And in the coming months, we're going to be expanding this work to uh, include demand charge savings from solar plus an added storage element. Um, and that will be led by um, our colleagues at NREL. 
We're also planning to package these to understand ways in which customer demand charge savings from solar align with utility cost savings from distributed solar. So um, why have we decided to conduct this analysis? Well, we've been motivated by the fact that most electric utilities in the U.S. offer commercial and industrial electricity rates with demand charges. And so to understand the customer economics of solar for those commercial customers, it's essential to understand the impact of solar on demand charges as demand charges are an essential part of the customer um, commercial bill. So as a reminder, demand charges are one of the com components of the customer's electricity bill, which is based on the customer's peak demand in kilowatts, uh, rather than how much energy they consume. Um, and the demand charge is really meant to recover a portion of the utility's capacity cost which are going to be driven by the system or utility peak load. Commercial PV um, has lagged behind residential PV in most states. And in part, this is because, well, commercial rates, I guess, tend to be slightly lower than residential ones, but also uh, in part due to challenges associated with evaluating potential demand charge savings from solar. Uh, at the same time, regulators and utilities are continuing to refine rates um, and rate designs across the board to try and better align price signals uh, sent through retail's rates with um, their own utility costs. So in this context, um, we've chosen to do this study, and it's really with these various stakeholders in mind that um, we, we chose to conduct this study. So to be clear, this analysis is not meant to advocate one way or another for demand charges, but instead to understand what customers may expect in terms of bill savings related to demand charges and to help understand how the customer bill savings may align with the utility cost savings uh, in the context of uh, cost-reflective rate design. So uh, a bit more background on demand charges. Um, as I've mentioned, demand charges come in a variety of, um, of designs. So aside from the most basic demand charge design, and this is also the most common demand charge design, where it's the, the demand charge is based on a peak demand, regardless of timing of that peak, and it's at the same level in uh, dollar per kilowatts for all months. And in addition to this kind of base de uh, demand charge, there are also a number of other designs available to utilities. Uh, one is seasonal differentiation. So here, some months will have a higher demand charge level than others. Uh, summer, non-summer is a common seasonal distinction. Another is how often uh, billing demand is evaluated, uh, as well as ratchets. Uh, though billing demand is usually determined on a monthly basis, it can also be evaluated on an annual basis, though the annual demand charges are uh, not included in this analysis. Ratchets can also be used. So a ratchet sets billing demand any given month as a fixed percentage of the maximum demand in the previous year. And this makes uh, the customer's annual peak load drive monthly demand charges. Uh, billing demand is usually uh, measured as an average load over a predefined time interval. Um, this can be often 15 minutes up to an hour or even more. The timing of uh, billing demand measurement is another demand charge design um, which can be differentiated. As I mentioned, the most common demand charge is based on the maximum customer demand during a billing period, but it can also be measured over a predefined peak window. Uh, billing demand can also be defined as customer load at the actual time of system peak, though uh, we don't um, look at that in, in our analysis. Uh, related to this, the predefined peak window definition can vary to cover a range of hours in the day. So this is where you only consider peak load within a specific range of hours. 
And finally, demand charges can be tiered, so where demand charges change as um, your billing demand increases. Uh, but we don't uh, consider this in the um, study. So now on to the methodology uh, before we jump into the results. Uh, so the analysis is based on 30-minute weather data spanning a 17-year historical period from 1998 to 2014 from the National Solar Radiation Database. Now, those who uh, read the residential uh, analysis will see that this is actually a very similar method um, than, than that, and uh, based on the similar weather data as well. So uh, using the weather data, we simulate building loads um, for commercial customers using the Energy Plus commercial reference building models uh, developed by the DOE. The simulations are performed across 15 U.S. cities, uh, representing most of the weather regions in the U.S. We simulate 15 customer types, uh, which include uh, supermarkets, restaurants, schools, retail stores, offices, hospitals, apartment buildings, and hotels. And using that same weather data, we simulate rooftop PV generation using NREL's system advisor model. So these simulations are performed uh, for the same set of U.S. cities and across PV sizes uh, that range from 10% to 100% of each customer's annual energy consumption. Um, we call this a 10% to 100% PV to load ratio, and I'll be using that term through the presentation. Um, we look at several orientations, including south, southwest, west, and flat panels. And in the end, this uh, leaves us with 9,000 pairs of building load and PV generation data, where we cover kind of each combination of each of these um, customer and PV characteristics. Um, so for each pair of load PV data, we then estimate monthly demand charge savings from solar by comparing demand charges with and without solar under numerous demand charge designs that I'll be summarizing in the following slide. Uh, for more details on the methodology, um, I'll let you kind of explore the appendix of the full briefing, which has uh, a few more details um, on, on our method. So here are the demand charges that we simulated in the study. Uh, the first one, again, I call the basic demand charge, uh, or sometimes the non-coincident basic. I'll be using non-coincident and basic throughout the presentation. And this is simply based on the customer's monthly peak over a 30-minute averaging window. I call it uh, the non-coincident demand charge because uh, the customer's billing demand doesn't necessarily coincide with um, any kind of system peak. We also consider a seasonal demand charge, where the demand charge levels during the summer months are three times higher than for the rest of the year. Uh, the ratchet, we, semi we um, simulate set billing demand any given month to 90% of the customer's maximum load in the previous year. Uh, though in most cases, we consider a 30-minute averaging interval, we're also going to look, uh, we, we've also simulated averaging windows of one, two, and four hours. And finally, we consider a large number of peak window definitions. So in fact, uh, we've simulated 66 different peak window definitions. We start and end times from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So for example, a 12 to 4 p.m. peak demand charge sets the billing demand as the monthly maximum demand during those hours any given day. And we'll be, um, we'll be giving several examples of, of these throughout the presentation. So as with all research studies, and particularly uh, when based on simulation, the study has uh, its limitations, and I wanted to spend a couple minutes kind of discussing boundaries. So first, what I'll be discussing today is the percentage reduction in demand charges due to solar. Uh, because there's a wide variety in demand charge levels, We've chosen to abstract from the dollar uh, amount in uh, dollar per kilowatt. 
And also, um, as a reminder, this deals with percentage reductions in demand charges only. Uh, of course, with net metering, solar also reduces the energy portion of the bill, and we are not covering that portion, uh, just the demand charges. Uh, as I mentioned when introducing the methodology, the load profiles and PV generation profiles are simulated. And though they're going to reflect weather-related variations, they don't reflect all sources of customer load variability. So for example, uh, the simulated load profiles don't reflect variations across customers within any given city in occupancy patterns or perhaps all possible differences in end-use equipment. Um, this doesn't necessarily indicate a systematic under or overestimation of the demand char uh, charges. Uh, the analysis uh, doesn't consider storage or demand management, which of course would impact the ability for PV to reduce demand charges. Um, but as I mentioned, we're, we're going to be considering storage in uh, a future study. Although we consider a fair number of demand charge designs, of course there are uh, other ones that are possible, and, and we, we only cover the ones that I've discussed. Uh, we consider 30-minute averaging intervals and greater, but of course some demand charges are based on shorter time periods. Um, we consider 30-minute averaging intervals simply because uh, that's the shortest uh, resol uh, time resolution that we have for our weather data um, in the, um, nas from the National Solar radiation database. 15-minute uh, average intervals would likely yield lower demand charge savings than the estimates presented here uh, because our results indicate the demand charge savings increase with the length of the averaging interval, and we'll, we'll go into more detail on that. And finally, we're, we should note that a number of figures, uh, we show results for PV system sizes that cover up to 100% of the customer's annual load. Um, that said, we recognize that uh, roof space often constrains the maximum PV system size to uh, a number that's less than that, and in some cases, uh, much less. So um, before we jump into the results in terms of the demand charge savings, I want to uh, focus a little bit on the simulated load profiles we use in this analysis. Uh, the load profiles for the various building types are quite different, as one would expect. And the figure here to the left uh, shows the distribution of monthly peak hours for a selection of commercial customer types. Uh, in this plot, as well as the other box and whisper plots in the presentation, uh, the Xs you see are uh, the mean values. The shaded box are the 25th to 75th percentile ranges. That middle line you see is the median, and the air bars or, or the whiskers are the inner quartile range, which basically excludes the outliers. Um, and the left panel are the distribution of monthly peak hours without any PV for the different um, selected commercial customer types. And on the right panel, we have um, we introduce PV systems that generate 50% of the customer's annual load. Again, we call that a 50% PV to load ratio. So we care about this because solar PV generation can only reduce demand charges if PV generation coincides with these peak uh, hours. So as we can see, there's a large range in peak hours from one building to the next, and sometimes from one month to the next for the same building. Uh, hotels, for example, tend to peak in the evening at around 8 p.m., whereas schools tend to peak in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, for some building types, such as restaurants, uh, sometimes the peak hour is in the morning during uh, breakfast or food preparation time, or sometimes at lunchtime. When you add PV, peak loads can either be pushed later to the day, um, as we see with the retail uh, stores, as well as um, the uh, apartments and restaurants, or sometimes the peak can be pushed to earlier in the day, as we see with the larger range observed with offices and schools. Of course, the timing 
of the peak load is not the only important factor that influences how effectively uh, solar can reduce demand charges, the shape of the load profile, the load factor, as well as the daily variability of load are also going to play a role, uh, as well, of course, as the PV uh, generation profile. So when presenting the results, I'm going to be using one main demand charge saving metric. Uh, the metric used is percentage reduction in billing demand, which is billing demand reduction over billing demand without PV. And this provides a point of comparison to bill savings that can be achieved through volumetric rates. And it's really a simple uh, way to translate um, this number into bill savings by just multiplying uh, by the dollar per kilowatt amount. But at the same time, it allows us to avoid having to make assumptions about the specific demand charge rate level. It doesn't, however, provide a point of comparison to utility cost savings, which makes use of the bulk power capacity credit. And for that, we use another metric that I'm not going to be discussing uh, in today's webinar, but which is present in the full um, briefing appendix online. So finally, let's get to some results. So under the demand charge design that we've called the basic non-coincident demand charge design, solar isn't particularly effective at reducing demand charges. So the figure here shows the distribution of billing demand reduction under this basic design across all of the 9,000 simulations uh, where the median billing demand uh, we see here is about 7%. And 20% of the cases have a demand charge savings less than 2%. And about 10% of the uh, simulations have savings that are greater than 15%. So the chart is based on, again, all the combinations of load and PV simulation profiles over all the months over the 17-year period considered. The main reason for which demand charge reductions are so small is that customer loads tend not to coincide that well with PV generation, with uh, a few exceptions, of course. Now, uh, if we choose to focus on the tail ends of the distribution in the previous slide, we see that the tails are dominated by a few customer types and locations. The figure to the left here uh, shows the percentage of simulations within each demand charge saving bin that are made up of these three customer type groups. In gray, uh, majority on the far left bars are the hotels and apartments which peak in the late afternoon and evening times, and hence whose peak loads are not affected uh, and not reduced by solar PV generation, leading to no demand charge savings from solar. The orange bars um, on the right are schools and smaller offices and in uh, predominantly sunny cities. And these are building combinations that tend to have load profiles that coincide pretty well with PV generation and hence dominate the higher tail ends of the distribution with a median demand charge reduction of about 18%. So in this slide here, we can see using this graphical example why solar is not so effective at reducing demand charges when the load peaks in the evening time. So the figure shows of Phoenix Hotel's growth load without PV uh, in blue, the customer's PV generation in the gray line, and the customer's net load in the orange line. Indeed, as hotels tend to peak in the evenings, solar generation can't change the peak times. As we see here, the PV generation completely falls off uh, before the load peaks. And though the net load profile is affected during the hours about 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., it's identical after 6 p.m., and hence PV generation is really not able to reduce the peak load and hence the non-coincident demand charge. However, were the demand charge defined as the peak load between noon and 4 p.m., for example, then PV could reduce the demand charge even for evening peaking customers such as this one. We'll dig into uh, 
more um, demand charge designs later in the webinar. Um, now let's consider a graphical example of a customer on the other end of the distribution in demand charge saving, uh, a school in Phoenix. The figure here is similar to the one on the previous slide, except this is for school's load profile. Again, the blue line shows load without PV, the gray line is the PV generation, and the orange line is the difference between the two. As you can see, uh, the load profiles uh, show some uh, relative qualitative similarities as the PV generation, in as much as the peaks, during, um, the peaks happen during the day, and then it drops off to the minimum levels in the evening and night time. In fact, this is pretty much as good as it gets um, in terms of coincidence in all the buildings we simulated. And it's still not, not, it's still not that great, um, which is why we don't have even higher uh, demand charge savings from, from school. Um, however, the non-coincident billing demand levels can be reduced still as indicated in the black arrow on the figure. So again, as a reminder, when I say non-coincident demand, I mean the customer's peak demand independent of the timing of that peak. Um, and, and it's really to differentiate with the peak demand charges which are defined using the peak demand coinciding with the predefined peak window. Of course, the figure here is for one single day. Um, and a relatively sunny um, day as well. If the customer is in an area with, um, which tends to have many cloudy days, then this particular day, um, if, if the particular day had a monthly peak load without PV, peak load would probably switch to another cloudy day when PV is unable to reduce the demand charge. Hence, as long as the customer's daily load profiles is not very much within the month, demand reduction from PV, PV is limited by the month cloudiest day. So indeed, the demand charge reduction is highest for the sunniest locations. Cloudier locations have lower average demand charge reductions as a single cloud event can really eliminate the demand charge savings from solar altogether. And this actually provides um, a good segue to the following slide. So indeed, if we look at the variation in the non-coincident demand charge savings, we see that a lot of that variation is driven by location. So the figure here on the left shows the percentage demand charge reduction for school on the left panel and for restaurants on the right panel for single PV system size. Um, what we see here is that for the four cities listed, uh, which all tend to be in uh, sunnier regions, ha they have the highest demand charge savings, whereas all uh, the other have lower savings from solar. And this indicates that cloudiness really uh, does reduce the potential for solar to reduce peak demand. And these locational dif differences really largely hold across PV system sizes as well as for um, other building types that I don't uh, present here. So we've also, um, so we, we've already uh, considered the two tail ends of the distributions. But if we look at each building type in more detail for the basic non-coincident demand charge, we see a pretty large range by building type. Um, the figure here provides a good summary of those distributions of the non-coincident demand charge reductions by building type for a single PV system size. Again, if we consider all simulations with the non-coincident demand charge, we see that most buildings, when excluding the tails of the distributions, um, demand charge reductions are about 5 to 10 percent um, for PV system size to generate half of the customer's annual load. So until now, we've been focusing on um, the results for the basic uh, demand charge, the non-coincident demand, which is basically the customer's peak load during the month, independent of timing. This basic demand charge design is the most common of the demand charges available in most utilities, but there are a number of other demand charge designs out there 
which I've um, presented earlier in the, in the presentation. And as utilities are going to move forward uh, towards more cost-reflective demand charges, they may consider demand charges um, that more closely align with the cost that they're trying to recover through the demand charge in the first place um, in terms of timing, um, for example. So this figure shows the range in percentile, uh, in percentage um, of uh, demand reductions for some of the demand charge designs we considered here for a single PV to load ratio. Uh, compared with the basic non-coincident demand charge design, both the seasonal uh, demand charges as well as the ratchet have similar distributions in demand charge reduction. Uh, the longer demand average window provides slightly higher demand charge reduction from solar, and we'll be looking a little bit more into that later in the pre presentation. And the demand charge savings really um, uh, can be higher when we use the peak period demand charge design, where demand is defined over a specific window of time, though these demand charge savings really depend on how the window, uh, peak window is defined. So uh, for a window of time that ends relatively early, such as the noon to 4 p.m., the demand charge reduction is going to be highest because this window coincides best with PV generation. When the peak window extends into the evening time, demand charge reductions are going to be lower, as peak uh, load are often later in the day, and PV, therefore, is less effective at reducing demand charges. Uh, this is why we see the 4 to 8 p.m. demand charge design um, has a lower demand charge reduction on average than the noon to 4 p.m. peak window design. So I should note here that the figure is an average for each customer and doesn't include the month-to-month very building demand charge savings. Uh, I'm not going to be presenting any results vis-a-vis um, -vis the month-to-month -month variability, though I do have a slide that covers this in the um, full briefing online. So an interesting finding um, that holds for all the demand charge designs that we looked at um, is that there's a diminishing return on demand charge reductions as you increase the PV system size. Now, um, this means that we consider, as we consider larger customer PV systems, each incremental kilowatt is going to be less effective at reducing the demand charge. We see this in the figure on this slide. The figure shows uh, the demand charge reduction for three different customer types for two demand charge designs, all in sunny Phoenix. Uh, the green line represents hotels, the orange restaurants, and the blue schools. And the solid lines are going to be for the non-coincident basic demand charge. The dotted line um, is uh, for the noon to 4 p.m. demand charge. The y-axis is demand charge reduction, and the x-axis um, or uh, represents PV system size in terms of PV to load ratio. In contrast to a volumetric energy charge, we see here that demand charge savings do not scale directly in proportion to PV system size. For example, under a basic non-coincident demand charge design, a school in Phoenix with a PV system size uh, to meet just 20% of its annual energy needs reduces the demand charge by 16% in the median case. But if you size it to 100%, so a, a system that's five times larger, this reduces demand charges by only 29%. And, and this diminishing returns occurs for uh, several reasons. So A, larger systems push peaks demand into later in the day. Larger systems push peaks, um, peak demand to cloudy days. And under peak period demand charge design, demand charges in some months can be eliminated, in which case further increases in uh, system size don't yield any additional savings. For the basic non-coincident demand charge design, the degree to which uh, there are diminishing returns with increasing PV system size will depend on the commercial customer type. So restaurants, for example, quickly reach their maximum non-coincident demand charge reductions with a relatively small PV system, whereas demand charge reductions continue to increase 
uh, with increasing PV system size for schools, as we show in Phoenix in uh, this figure. Uh, we see here also that there's some diminishing returns uh, for the 12 to 4 p.m. peak uh, period demand charge, but really to a lesser degree. Um, and in contrast with the basic non-coincidence demand charge, peak load can't be driven into the early morning or evening hours. So the demand charge really can continue to decrease as long as it's not cloudy or not already zero. However, because there are some cloudy days or sometimes um, the demand charge is already zero, there are still some diminishing returns with increasing PV system size. So uh, the next slide here is a graphical example of this diminishing return effect. Uh, so the figure shows a load pro profile for um, an example customer with a PV um, system. So the kind of gross load without any PV is in brown. And then the net load profile for increasing PV system size is shown in the lower lines, blue, orange, and gray. So as we move from no PV to a 10% PV to load ratio, the peak reduction goes from point A to point B. Then when we move to a larger PV system, a 20% PV to load ratio, the peaks get pushed later in the day, which is um, in point C, but still goes down. As a PV system is increased to an even larger PV to load ratio to point D, PV isn't really able to reduce the demand charge anymore, and the diminishing returns start to be observed. Any larger PV systems aren't going to be effective at reducing demand charge as the net load is already pushed into that evening hour. So as we saw in the earlier slide comparing the demand charge reduction across demand charge designs, moving from the basic non-coincident demand charge to the noon to 4 p.m. peak window demand charge increases demand charge reductions for customers on average. However, among those customers modeled, some are going to be doing significantly better under the noon to 4 p.m. peak uh, demand charge, whereas others do just a little bit better. So the figure here shows the distribution of demand charge reductions for various building types for the basic demand charge in blue and the noon to 4 p.m. demand charge in orange for a single PV system size. As we clearly see on the chart, hotels improve the most as demand charges go from basic to a noon to 4 peak design and schools improve the least with other building types uh, somewhere in between. This, of course, is because hotels um, for, for hotels, PV can't reduce the evening peak, but it can reduce the peak if it's defined between the noon and 4 p.m. Um, period. Whereas for schools, the non-coincident peak is for many months already between the hours of noon to 4. So adding that restriction really doesn't make much of a difference for most months. Another interesting observation here is that building types with load that peak earlier in the demand window are going to have greater savings from peak period demand charges. And this is the case, for example, uh, for restaurants. We see that there's a great increase of demand charge reduction as we move from the basic to 12 to 4 p.m. And this um, is due to the fact that the restaurants will have a peak within that period around lunchtime hours. And this is also the peak, of course, for PV generation. And this is, um, therefore, PV has more of an ability to reduce that peak within that noon to four period for restaurants. So in the figure here, we are comparing the non-coincident demand charge reduction for four different orientations considered in the analysis for three building types in Phoenix, as well as the noon to four peak um, peak period uh, window on the right side. For each building type, we held the PV system size constant in kilowatt terms so that we can really enable uh, a fair comparison among those different orientations. So the most uh, salient observation from this figure is that there really isn't so much of a strong trend um, moving across the different orientations across the different building types. Although west and southwest facing panels do lead to a slightly higher demand um, charge reduction 
3% at most in the simulations considered. Uh, similar trends were observed for all building types and PV system sizes. Uh, the benefit for west-facing over south-facing panel was slightly higher than for the peak window definitions later in the afternoon, but demand charge savings were generally much lower as well. We should note that although the demand charge reduction is slightly higher for west-facing panels than for south-facing panels, the decrease in kilowatt hours uh, generated um, related to going from the south to west-facing is going to be much more significant. So insofar as there's going to be a net metering for these customers and that um, they are under a flat rate, the net impact uh, from going from the south to west facing panels is probably going to be um, negative overall. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly through the next few slides in the interest of time. Um, so this slide here compares the demand charge reductions for various uh, demand charge designs. Um, and um, effectively what we see is this figure here, which shows the range in demand charge reductions for four different averaging periods, so 30 minutes through the four hours, for the three building types listed here, and uh, for both the basic and the noon to four um, demand um, peak period. So the most significant trend we observe is the increase in demand charge reduction as you increase the length of the averaging window. And we observe this for both demand charge designs and for all uh, building types shown on the figure. And this trend is really the result from the fact that averaging load over long periods of time can smooth out variability in PV generation uh, for, due to intermittent cloud cover, for example as well as better align load and PV generation when peak occurs later in uh, the daytime. Um, now, in the last uh, slide's results for the day, we do a similar deeper dive uh, into the seasonal demand charges. And uh, the main conclusion here is that we really didn't observe much of a boost the demand charge savings as we um, add a seasonal element. And this holds across uh, most building types as well as across uh, the um, various demand charge designs that we um, simulated. So let's wrap this up with a few conclusions uh, and policy implications for the work. Um, so first, the most basic, I guess, or fundamental conclusion is that for that basic non-coincident demand charge, most commercial customers generally can't reduce their demand charge by much. In fact, uh, most customers with PV that uh, generate, for example, half of their annual load, rooftop solar uh, reduces non-coincident uh, demand charge by a median of 7% um, and less than 15% uh, in 90% of the cases considered. Uh, if we compare this to the residential results uh, from the previous study, commercial uh, customers can generally reduce their demand charge more uh, with solar because commercial load profiles, although diverse, tend to uh, peak um, earlier in the day than residential customers. So next, the demand charge savings may be significantly greater when based on predefined peak periods. Uh, and on longer time averaging intervals. So, um, for example, if it's based on the customer's maximum demand during the 12 to 4 peak period, commercial solar reduces demand charges by about 19% in the median case. So demand charge savings from commercial are also going to be sensitive to the length of the averaging interval, as we've seen. And, um, what this also leads to is that other demand charge design elements really generally have less significance for bill uh, savings from solar. And as we saw, seasonal, um, varying, seasonally varying demand charges aren't really providing much of a, a boost for demand charge reduction. And uh, the same holds for uh, ratchets, which I didn't, pre uh, didn't present detailed um, results. So uh, demand charge reductions 
are going to be heavily dependent on the building type. So as we've seen, uh, they can vary significantly from one commercial building group to another. Um, so those comparisons are really going to differ depending on the, the demand charge design. Um, the ability for PV to reduce non coincident demand charge for most commercial customers is going to be limited by this relatively poor coincidence between load and PV generation, um, as well as cloudiness, of course. For the 12 to 4 p.m. peak period, um, there are also differences in demand charge reductions by commercial building types, but these are much less significant um, for the non coincident than, than for the non coincident demand charge reduction, given that the variability in load profiles, if you just look at that 12 to 4 p.m. period, is uh, much lower. So um, as we've shown, the demand charge savings increase with PV system size, but with diminishing returns. And we've also shown that you know, when we uh, orient the PV panels westward and southwest, we do see a slight increase in demand charge savings, but really uh, pretty moderate levels. So finally, let's finish with a few policy implications. Um, the widespread use of the demand charge for commercial customers may tend to direct solar deployment towards particular business types, and uh, this will likely constrain overall growth. So uh, in particular, non coincident demand charges could have a limiting effect on commercial deployment overall, given that most commercial customers can generally expect a small demand charge reduction. Um, it's going to be concentrated in those uh, building types and customer segments which have the highest demand charge reductions, whether it be schools, offices, or other customers with late afternoon. And deployment patterns could be spread more evenly across commercial customers if we considered uh, a peak window demand charges, which tend to reduce the differences among customer types in demand charge reductions. Uh, also, some demand charges designs are going to be clearly other uh, better than others for, for solar customers. Um, and um, although maybe a few customer types do well with the basic non-coincident demand charge, most are doing relatively well under um, the peak demand charge design going from noon to 4 p.m., for example, or even the longer um, time interval. Now, demand charges incentivize uh, commercial customers to install smaller PV systems. Um, as we saw, larger PV systems don't generate proportionally larger demand charge reductions, and um, this is really starkest with the basic non-coincident demand charge. Um, but we also see this with peak demand um, windows um, as well. So, um, this suggests that smaller PV systems are going to be more effective at reducing demand charge in terms of bill savings. So demand charges, uh, finally, may not always align well with utility cost savings from solar. This is going to be the subject of future work. Um, so I'll be going into a lot more detail. But basically, uh, what these particular findings show is that there could be a lot of diversity in the demand charge savings from one customer to the next as well as for different PV system sizes. And this doesn't um, reflect the utility cost savings because um, we know that utility cost savings, at least in, um, uh, in uh, a similar distribution network, are going to be similar from one customer to the next. So a school located next to a hotel, for example, uh, will all have the same value uh, provided to the utility but the demand charges are going to give uh, significantly uh, different, um, different um, value to the customer. Uh, there are scenarios where um, the demand charge align better with utility savings uh, from solar, however. Um, and, and this is particular for a select number of customers. So uh, that concludes the presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, finish with about 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, Andrew has been collecting questions at the bottom left of your screen in the chat box. Um, and if you haven't already entered them, um, you can go ahead and um, enter them now. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank 
uh, the the um, program managers and uh, members of the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office for their uh, support of this work, as well as the folks here um, uh, from our advisory group. Um, if you need to get in touch with uh, myself, Naeem, this is my email address, as well as my phone number. You can download the executive summary as well as the full um, demand charge uh, briefing right here at this link. Um, and um, let's see if there are any questions. Andrew? Great. Thank you, Naeem. Um, <clears throat> we do have a number of questions coming in. Um, please keep them coming as, as we go. Um, the first one was just whether or not uh, all of the, the areas that you focused on were sunny areas, um, and then how would you expect demand charges demand charge reductions to compare for a cloudy area versus more of a sunny area? Is it always going to be lower? Yeah, so um, we did consider those 15 cities, and then among those 15 cities, we did have a few, you know, uh, relatively cloudy areas. Uh, there are two kinds of cloudy areas um, that kind of make a difference for demand charge charges. You have uh, areas that are have kind of long periods of cloudiness, such as uh, Seattle, for example, which is included in our simulations. And here we, we do see um, constant, you know, relatively constant uh, lower levels of, um, of demand charge savings because of those um, cloudy days. And then you also have places which have perhaps a lot of intermittent clouds, so they're not, you know, fully constant uh, full days of clouds, but perhaps thunderstorms, um, as we see in, in Miami, for example. And these will have different effects on, on demand charge savings, because with intermittent clouds, um, you're more likely to, um, to benefit from those longer averaging window periods. Um, and you're also less likely to match uh, have a, a cloud event um, match with your uh, peak generation time. Great. Okay. Uh, the next question is on the uh, sort of aligning uh, utility and customer interest. So uh, the demand charge reduction is really a customer view perspective, and a view from the utility might be different and that the contribution of solar into the grid might have a higher value to the utility, even if it's not a high value to the customer. Does this mean that there should be some sort of solar demand credit in rate design, similar to kilowatt hour credits for non-demand uh, charge rate designs? Yeah, so it really, A, is going to really depend on a few things. So one is what are the capacity uh, costs that the utility is looking to recover? So is it system, uh, so energy capacity costs, so gen energy generation capacity costs, or is it more T and D capacity costs, um, and of course, solar is going to have uh, different capacity credits um, depending on what we're looking to con consider. But we do know that for electric systems with relatively low overall solar penetration, uh, solar can have a capacity credit of uh, 30 to 70 percent. Um, and because, as as um, as uh, the question kind of pointed out, in most cases we have very small um, demand charge design, a uh, small demand charge reduction, this does indicate that, um, that there is a misalignment. Uh, and, and perhaps for those particular customers, uh, the, the PV customer is not kind of receiving the full value. Um, there may be other ways in which, um, which the utility may want to better align that, and perhaps they can do that by just restricting the window um, from, from kind of a basic demand charge to a much more narrow and even maybe coincident with peak. And that may be a way to increase the, the uh, demand charge savings for the customer and better match it with the uh, capacity credit. And I'm sure there are other ways as the, as the, the question, um, the person asking the question uh, indicated. Okay, and then related to that, <clears throat> is, doesn't the, the duck curve phenomenon where you have increasing amounts of solar um, pushing the, the net load uh, down in the middle of the day, doesn't that push the best window for demand charges um, out to sort of the more 4 to 8 p.m. window rather than the 12 to 4 window? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, 
So it, it, two things. One is it really depends what kind of cost um, the utility is looking to recover, what kind of capacity cost. If they are looking to recover energy generation capacity, um, then that's correct. Uh, you're, you're really contributing to peak in those later day, uh, those later hours, and the utility may uh, consider kind of those later hours, um, which significantly reduces the demand charge uh, reduction as we, um, as we, we saw in the results. Um, so, so the duck curve will impact it. That said, if the utility is looking to recover a distribution or transmission costs, the peak times may be different for that, and uh, they may be different from one utility to the next, and a utility may choose to, um, to um, kind of adjust that window appropriately, and that could be earlier um, even with the duck curve uh, the, the local distribution peak could be in the afternoon if it's a commercial distribution peak, for example. And therefore, the, the uh, solar system may be able to provide value by, by basically providing, uh, to re re you know, reducing that, that distribution peak. Great. And then from the customer perspective, it appears that uh, for several building types that the addition of solar leaves a narrow period of peak in the post-solar day that's really driving the demand charge. Um, uh, it would seem to the questioner that having a, a narrow residual peak period would actually improve the economics of storage to be able to shave off that remaining narrow peak that's driving the demand charge. And so are you examining that potential of sort of storage to be able to be more cost effective because it can shave off just that remaining narrow peak? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. So um, not in this particular study, um, because we're not, of course, uh, considering storage, but we do, we are looking at this in the, uh, the next study in the series, uh, again, led by NREL, and, and you know, we, we, it'll be published probably in the next month or so, uh, but what we are finding is that, yes, storage is particularly effective, and there are even synergistic effects where, um, solar and storage are working together to give uh, demand charge reduction that's greater than the sum of if you had each of them individual. And in part, that's because of exactly what the, the uh, person asking the question pointed out, is that you're con concentrating uh, that um, the peak hours with solar in those later, uh, into a kind of a relatively short um, period of time, and so solar can and more effectively um, um, reduce the demand charge there. Great. And then the last question uh, before we wrap up is, <clears throat> your analysis was based off of uh, simulations. How would you expect your results to differ if you were to use real meter data? Yeah, so uh, with real meter data, we would have probably more variability. Uh, so within any given customer group, uh, we maybe would see a larger range um, because we'd have some customers with different load profiles. Um, right now, the variability is only uh, related to, to the weather and location, but not to kind of uh, what kind of end-use equipment that each of the group has. So we would expect a larger range, but not, uh, you know, not a systematic upward or downward bias. Okay, and with that, we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you all for joining us, and um, we appreciate your, your great questions and, and, um, and feedback. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.